I want to invite you to grab your Bible and turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 8, verse number 18. And we're going to read just one verse in Luke 8, 18. And really, honestly, we're just focusing on the first statement in the verse. There are several statements here. It's a very rich scripture. Everything Jesus says is, is rich, and you can unpack it a long time. But we're really going to just go focus on the first statement in Luke 8, 18. And my plan tonight, we'll just see how the Holy Spirit leads us. My plan tonight is actually to read quite a few scriptures, quite a few passages, and to keep sort of my interjection to a minimum. So tonight is a lot less commentary and just more scripture speaking. And I'm just going to connect the dots um, as we go through scripture. And I'll set, that up, I'll set it up a little bit more in just a moment. So first, let's just start with Luke 8, 18. Let's read the scripture and then just simply pray that we all have an ear to hear what the Lord wants to say to us tonight. Luke 8, 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has to him, more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. Let's go back and read the first statement of Luke 8, 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. Let's pray. Lord, we want to pray tonight to simply do what that scripture tells us to do, to take heed how we hear. We want an ear to hear what you're saying. Lord, we want a heart of receptivity. We want everything within us, Lord, to be open wide, just as we sang a few moments ago. We want our hearts open wide tonight, our minds open wide tonight, Lord. Everything within us, receptive to what your spirit has, in Jesus' name, amen. So I had something totally different prepared for tonight, um, something I was really excited about, just like this word, you know, shut up in my bones type thing that I'd been just uh, praying over and, and just felt led to, to release, and maybe it'll be next week, maybe it'll be some other time, but I woke up from a dream that I, I had a dream last night, so I woke up from the dream this morning, and I just felt the Lord sort of interrupting that process, not that that word was wrong or bad, I think it has a time and a place and a season, but I woke up from a dream and I felt, as I processed the dream prayerfully, I felt the Lord just saying, yeah, let's, let's go this direction tonight. So does anybody want to do that? So let me tell you the dream. It's a very short one, and then I'll connect you to this scripture, and then we will go from there and um, see how the Lord leads us. So I'm having this dream this morning, and in the dream, the setting is like, um, as I was telling Delane of the dream, the only way how to describe it is what I would call like an old school chosen service. What I mean by that is um, we were like at, at this little country church, but it was full of expectation, full of young people. It was just packed out. And I have distinct memories of when I was traveling on Chosen and still in high school that we would go sometimes to these little country churches and they would just be packed out with people and it would just be like... God show up, God encounters, you know, just like deep, deep transformation happening in people's lives. It was that kind of atmosphere. So it was like an old school chosen service when I was still on the team, little country church, packed out. But it wasn't just a chosen service. It wasn't just Karen Wheaton and Chosen. It was much more like what we call like a road ramp or a road conference where our whole team was there. It was all of Chosen. It was our whole worship team. It was our whole leadership team. Eddie James was there. I mean, it was just like a big crew there. So while we were there, Miss Karen receives a prophetic word from another minister, and the word was this. <clears throat> let, let me get it right, because it's the whole crux of the message. So I'm going to make sure I'm precise with it. The word was this. Where you are in God determines how you reference the word he gave you. Where you are in God determines how you reference the word he gave you. So this minister released this word to Miss Karen, and when he first said it, I thought, well, that was kind of, I mean, it caught my attention. I was like, oh, that, that was great. But then later, Miss Karen gets up to minister, and she basically is so gripped by that statement, she has her eyes closed, and she just starts declaring it and again and again until we get it in the room. She just starts declaring, where you are, where you are in God determines how you reference the word he gave you. And she would declare it again and again and again and again and again until it was like, okay, I really need to grab a hold of this word. And that was basically the dream. I wake up from the dream. So I thought, Lord, maybe what you want to say to us tonight is this. Where you are in God determines how you reference the word that he gives you. And here's what I knew that 
meant within the dream. When God starts speaking to you, your internal reaction to that word is an indicator of how surrendered you are to Him. In other words, if God speaks to you and there is a joy over His voice, it's an indicator that you are at a deep place of surrender. That you are in a healthy trajectory. That you are in a place where, where it's not your will, but it's Jesus in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. Even if what he's telling you to do is hard, there's still a joy over the fact that he's speaking to you. You're just happy that you're hearing his voice. And when you reference it, when you think about it, when you talk about it, there's a joy in your eye because where you are in God is in a place of surrender. Conversely, if God speaks to you, and your internal sensation is dread, it's an indicator that there are still some unsurrendered places. And when you reference it and talk about it, if it's this heavy thing and this gnawing thing, and I don't really then, then it shows that there are some areas where we need to be broken. Not, not broken as, as though dysfunctional, broken in terms of God, not my will, but yours be done. Where you are in God determines how you reference the word that he gave you. So what I want to do is I want to look at, like I said a moment ago, quite a few passages of scripture that show us two different examples. Some of these scriptures are going to show us people who received a word, and at the word there was dread. And it revealed the level of unsurrender that they were at. Other people in the word received a word and there was joy revealing that they were in a place of just full commitment under the authority of God. All right, so let's first go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And we're going to again read this whole passage. And it's very clear to see where this person is in terms of level of surrender. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. Mark, 7, Mark 10, 17 through 22. Now as Jesus was going out on the road, he came running. One came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to Jesus, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. I love verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. So we know that anything else Jesus says after this moment is motivated by his love for the young man. Anything else he says is not to despise him. It's not to put a burden on him that he can't carry. Anything else Jesus says is out of the overflow of his passionate love for the young man. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross and follow me. Then watch the young man's internal reaction. But he was sad at this word. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. How many times does Jesus, out of his love, invite us closer? And rather than seeing the love that's inviting us closer, all we can see is the pain of the sacrifice it requires. And rather than the young man being excited that he got an invitation only 12 other people got... Rather than the young man being excited at the invitation of love, he was sad because the sacrifice was too great. He had great possessions. And rather than being surrendered to Jesus, he was instead held captive by his possessions. And 
the way he went away was sorrowful. And I'm sure when he recounted the story to others, the way he referenced the word that Jesus gave him, it was an indicator of where he was in God. He didn't experience joy over the invitation. He experienced sadness. Now, we're going to go lots of other places. Just hang with me. Let's go to Revelation chapter 10. I just go to Revelation as much as I can these days. Any excuse to go to the book of Revelation, let's go there. Revelation chapter 10, starting in verse number 8. Revelation chapter 10, starting in verse number 8. This is John, of course, telling about this heavenly encounter he has. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now how does this connect to our theme of reacting to the Lord's word? Because John in advance knew it was going to be hard to digest the word God wanted to give him. The angel told him advance, in advance, when you eat this, it's going to be bitter in your stomach. But when you put it in your mouth, it'll be as sweet as honey. And just a few months ago, I was, I was praying through this whole thing that I believe the Lord's calling us to this year. Again, there's four areas I believe God wants to speak to us about in Ramp Church this year. Greater people of prayer, greater maturity in the prophetic, strengthen community and take ownership for our city. But going back to number two, maturity in the prophetic. I was praying about that element of maturity in the prophetic. And I felt the Lord begin to speak to me about John and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah. And the whole idea was this. They so loved to hear my voice that even when I had to speak to them hard words, those words were still sweet as honey as they were hearing them. They may be hard to digest, but, you're, but they were thankful that they were hearing me. And I want to live in a place, and I believe God wants us to live in a place as Ramp Church that says, God, even if you need to say hard things, we would rather hear your voice telling us hard things than not hear your voice at all. And the angel told him in advance, John, when you swallow this, it's going to be bitter in your stomach. It's going to be hard to digest. It's going to bring you into birth pangs, and it's going to be difficult. John said, I know it's going to be bitter in my stomach, but it's still sweeter to hear him than to live not hearing him. And if I've got to prophesy about nations and kingdoms and kings, give me the word because I want to hear his voice. And so to be surrendered to the Lord is to be like John, to say, God, even when it's hard to digest, I still want to hear your voice. It's still sweet as honey in my ear. John's not the first person, the only person that had this experience. Let's go back to the book of Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. We're going to read, it's a short chapter. We're going to read all of chapter 2 on into the first three verses of chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 2. Again, very applicable for us as a house, especially with the pronounced way God has called us to be a, a, a group, a community, a church of watchmen. And again, I just can't say it enough. If you missed Pastor Josh's teaching on being a watchman a couple of Wednesdays ago, get on the YouTube channel, Ramp Church Hamilton YouTube channel, and watch it. I've been so stirred. It has literally shifted some things in my life, that whole teaching about being with the Lord. One of the statements he said, I'm not teaching on this tonight, but one of the statements he said was this, Fat watchmen fast sleep so they can wake others up. And just that statement right there, like, Lord, I want to be one of those that says, I endeavor to stay awake. Because when watchmen hear his voice, they can release it into the earth to wake other people up. So, that's just a little, little highlight. you got to get into the whole message. All right, Ezekiel chapter 2 on down into chapter, uh, Ezekiel 2 on down into chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Then he said to me, 
Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then the Lord entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. And I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are an impudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Ask for them whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed of their looks. Though they are a rebellious house, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not, re do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Okay, we're about to go on. I can already sense, Ezekiel can already sense, I don't think I'm going to be received. I mean, God is emphasizing they are rebellious. They are rebellious. If they don't receive you, still say what I'm going to say to you. And it's almost like God is preparing Ezekiel for massive rejection. And he's like really having a way in his spirit right now. Am I going to answer the call to say what God's telling me? Am I going to rejoice that he's speaking to me? Or am I like the rich young ruler going to be sad at the word and turn my ear away? And so he's in this moment where he's being called and he's in this vision. Now verse 9. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me and there was writing on the inside and on the outside. And written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Think about that. Written on this scroll was lamentations and mourning and woe. It doesn't sound like a very pleasant message. Chapter 3, verse number 1. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. I like the forcefulness there. I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the scroll. In other words... Ezekiel, it's like a baby being fed in a high chair. He like barely opened his mouth. You know, as a parent, as soon as that mouth opens, <clears throat> you're just like, you're getting it in there. Sometimes you miss and there's like just green beans all over the face. But it's like, wait, he's like, it's like Ezekiel's weighing it and he's like, Do I, am, I gonna, am I gonna eat that? It's got lamentations and mourning. Well, he opens his mouth and it says, and he caused me to eat that scroll. Watch verse three. And he said to me, son of man, Feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that I gave you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Lamentations, mourning, and woe? How can that be like honey in your mouth? Because the prophet loved hearing the voice of the Lord. It didn't matter what the voice of the Lord was saying. It just mattered that he was speaking and he was leaning in and eating the scroll, even, the, even though the scroll had lamentation and mourning and woe. And can we be a people? That can say to God, even if what you have to say to me is hard and it equals my rejection and it doesn't make me famous and it doesn't make me cool and it doesn't make me all of these things that the world values. If you're speaking it, it's going to be like honey in my mouth. I want it. John had this. Ezekiel had this. Jeremiah had this. Oh, Lord. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 16. I got over here in the book of Micah somehow. I don't know. Let's go back. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, verse number 16. I love this verse right here. I feel like it's one of those verses I grew up hearing people quote my whole life. Hearing Miss Karen quote it often in ministry. And it so marked me that it became a guiding value of my life. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 16. Again, Jeremiah didn't prophesy easy things. Some people say, I've heard Brian, Pastor Brian said this for years. It was said about Jeremiah, he didn't have one convert in the entirety of his living ministry. So it's not like he had an easy road. 
Just like Ezekiel, he was sent to a rebellious house. But what did Jeremiah say about God's words to him, even though they were hard words? Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 16. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words were to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Of my heart. That'd be a great verse for you to jot down and say, memorize later. Your words were found and I did eat them. And they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. John loved the word of the Lord even when it was hard to digest. Ezekiel loved the word of the Lord even when it was lamentation and mourning and woe. Jeremiah loved the word of the Lord even though it didn't equal, productive, spectacular ministry. He just loved to hear God speak. Let's look at Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 50. As you can see, we're hanging with some of the prophets. Isaiah chapter 50. Now, these are familiar scriptures, verses 4 through 6, but sometimes we forget the second half of 5 and the rest of verse 6. Again, 4 and 5 is pretty familiar to us, but 4 through 6 really has a lot to say. So Isaiah is writing about his own prophetic ministry, also prophesying about Jesus, the Messiah. And here's what Isaiah writes. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord has opened my ear. Now, again, that's kind of sometimes the extent of where we go with that. He wakes me morning by morning. Give me a word in due season to him who is weary. God, give me the tongue of the learned. Make me sound good when I speak. You know, all that stuff. We love that part. But watch how Isaiah continues to describe this journey prophetically of hearing the Lord and the sacrifice it requires of him. The Lord has opened my ear, verse 5, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheek to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Obviously prophesying about Jesus, but also embodying the commitment of prophetic ministry to say when God opens my ear, I'm not going to shut it just because it, re- it requires suffering. I'm not going to hold back what he gives me just because it causes persecution. That's that's what Isaiah is saying. When God opened my ear, I was not rebellious and I didn't turn away from his word. No, I was in a place of such surrender, just like Ezekiel, just like John, just like Jeremiah, that if I'm sent to a rebellious people and they have to hang me and saw me in two, I'm going to deliver the word God gave me. That was Isaiah's internal commitment. And right after that is when he says, I have set my face like a flint, determined to do the will of God. Because his value was not for whether or not he was accepted for what he heard. His value was the fact that I'm hearing something. And it may be bitter to digest and hard to understand. But it's sweet to hear the voice of the Lord. And even if it means shaking, The fact that he's speaking is enough for me. Let's go to John chapter 6. Like I said, we're just looking at several passages and comparing different reactions to the word of the Lord. John chapter 6. And we're going to read not the whole chapter. It's like 70 verses or so. I mean, it's a big one. It's like John 6 and Luke 1. It's like, why did you guys make those chapters so long, guys? Just break them up a little. Okay. Okay. John chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 53. Now, the reason I'm starting verse 53 is because Jesus is talking a lot about eating his flesh, drinking his blood. And in that, if we understand that Jesus is the word from heaven, you see the similarity to Ezekiel, eat the word. To John, eat the word. To Jeremiah, I found the word and I ate the word. To Isaiah, my ear was open. I didn't resist it and hold back. So think about those themes as we're reading John Chapter 6, verse number 53 and forward. Then Jesus said to the most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which come, came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, watch this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Oh, whoa. How many times does Jesus need to ask us that question? He speaks to us. And it requires something sacrificial. And we're weighing whether or not we're going to embrace it. And I can imagine Jesus having to look at us. And if we could open our ears a little more, we would hear him going, does this offend you? And it's almost like he's implying, good, it should. Does this offend you? Does this bother you that it's a hard saying? Does this bother you? That it may have been sweet to hear my voice, but it's difficult to digest the message? Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to, the fa- can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Why did they walk with him no more? Because he said something that was hard. He said something hard and difficult. And what do we do with it? And how does that apply? And because what he said was hard, they went away no more. Why? Because... How you reference, where you are in God determines how you reference what he said to you. And it was an indicator that though they were in the crowd, they had still not yet surrendered to his authority. So they went on to talk about that crazy Jesus from Nazareth who said a bunch of crazy things. And the way they referenced his word was an indicator of where they were on a heart level. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, I love it, Jesus is so unmoved. Doesn't mean he's not compassionate, but it's not shaking him on an insecurity level. He's not worried about his authority in the earth because a few people didn't like what he said. So watch this. Then Jesus looked at the twelve and said, do you also want to go away? In other words, he doesn't change his message. To make sure they felt more comfortable. He says, this saying is hard and you're either going to deal with it and stay or you're going to be offended by it and leave. It's up to you. But I'm not bending what I said. (laughs) What do you do with this guy? What do you do with him? What do you do with him? Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? And I love, I love Simon Peter's response. But Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What did he do? He did what John did and said, I don't know how to digest that. But you, when you speak, the words are sweet like honey. And I may not know how to apply them. I may not know what they're going to require out of me. But they are the words of eternal life. And if you're saying them, I'm here for it. I'm there. I'm writing it down. My heart, I'm wide open, God. I'm wide open. I don't get it. And yes, it's painful to listen and obey sometimes. But I'm here And I'm not going anywhere because you alone have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe, Peter says, and know that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. In other words, I already know too much about you to leave now. 
I believe God is looking for a people who have grown to a place of intimacy that even when they don't understand what he's saying, what he's doing, their response is, I already know too much about you to leave now. I'm not going anywhere. God, I'm not going anywhere. I don't get it. I don't understand. This is hard. But I'd rather be here listening to your hard sayings than go somewhere else that may be a little easier but it's not giving me eternal life. It's not the life. It's not the life you have called me to. And I just feel like we're at this decision place as a people about whether or not we're going to build our lives on the hard sayings of Jesus or go the easy route. And why am I saying this? Because the Bible says in the last days that men will heap up for themselves, they'll pile them up high. Teachers that will scratch their itching ears. Tell me something I want to hear. Don't give me that hard stuff. Don't give me the unpleasant stuff. Don't tell me the stuff that I don't like. I want something that's sweet to my mouth and sweet to my belly, and I know what to do with it. And it's... But God's looking for a people that he can say hard things to. Not because he's harsh, but because he speaks truth. And many times truth has to offend us before it can heal us. God's looking for a people that he can say hard things to. Let's go to the book of Acts. Thank you, Lord. And we're just about done. I sense it kind of coming to a close in just a moment. Let's go to the book of Acts. Oh, Lord, Jesus. And I want to show you again a response. Now, we've looked at a lot of people so far. The Johns, the Ezekiels, the Isaiahs, the Jeremiahs, who had an ear to hear what the Lord was saying. We've looked at a few that didn't. The crowds that went away because what he said was hard. You know, the rich young ruler, he was sad at the sacrifice rather than being excited over the invitation. Wow. That, that so grips me. I want to be someone that is excited over the invitation rather than sorrowful over the sacrifice. And if we are sorrowful over the sacrifice, it just shows there's places of unsurrender. And that's not to like beat anybody down. That's to say, then, then, let's, then let's bring our hearts to a fresh place of God. I just, I want to give you everything, you know? I want to give you everything. So much is going through my head. I'm just trying to, Lord. You know, there, there's, yeah, there's that moment, you know, where Jesus comes to the area of the Gadarenes. And there's a, there's a young man there who's full of a, of a legion of demons, cutting himself, living among the tombs. And when Jesus shows up, the man comes running, and he kneels at Jesus. And the demons start speaking through the man, and he says, Son of David, what do you have to do with us? Are you here to torment us? And though the demons said it, I'm sure the man's, being, man's perspective was being influenced by it. And, and when you're held in captivity by something, you don't see the call of Jesus as something that liberates you. You see the call of Jesus as something that is tormenting. Because you're so being influenced by the dark realm of the devil. And so Jesus was there to give the young man freedom. The freedom he had never known. To make him clothed and in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. And instead, the demons got him convinced that this man is not here to liberate me. This man is here to torment me. And when the nations look at the church and they look at the call of God, what do they do? Psalm 2, they begin to rage and say, let us throw off his bonds on us. And I want to tell you tonight, Jesus is the liberator. But it does require a bit of sacrifice. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 7. And there's this moment, again, where the, the word of the Lord is coming forth. This is right at the tail end, Acts 7, verse 54, right at the tail end of Stephen's message. Whoa, what a message. you got to go back and read the whole thing later. God is speaking, and watch the response to the gospel and the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 7. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. So, whoo, conviction, Cut to the heart. There's an opportunity here for repentance. There's an opportunity here for surrender. There's an invitation from heaven to accept the gospel, be saved, and follow Jesus. They were cut to the heart. But instead of repenting, what did they do? They gnashed at him with their teeth. They clenched themselves in their rebellion. 
They were sorrowful at the conviction rather than being thankful that it was there, okay? They gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And said, so Stephen says to those who were in front of him, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Another invitation. They're cut to the heart by conviction. They, they strengthen themselves in their resistance. So Stephen looks up, he sees a vision, and he calls again for them to look up and receive the gospel. He says, look, I see the heavens open. This is a moment, guys. The heavens are open. The Son of Man, he is standing up at the right hand of God. But watch the response, verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and what do they do? Stopped their ears. Stop their ears. Why? Because what Stephen was telling them was hard. Go back and read the whole message. It was hard. And rather than receive a hard word and see the heavens opened, they chose to stop their ears and stone the messenger. They stopped their ears and stoned the messenger. And they ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and crowd out, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he, when he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow, I want to invite the musicians to go ahead and join me. There's more scriptures, more examples, more passages, but I think we've got the general idea here. That when God speaks to us, we can either react the way they did right here by stopping our ears, or we can react by drawing near, even if it means sacrifice, even if it means repentance. Where you are in God, determines how you reference the word he gives to you. Will you reference that word with sorrow and sadness? Or will you receive that word with joy and gladness, even if it's a hard saying? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, quoting Psalm 95, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. In other words, when his voice comes, you have a decision to make. Will I be glad that it's an invitation to draw closer? Or will I be sad because it demands something sacrificial of me? One of my other favorite scriptures in regard to this is found in Psalm 27. And I love this verse. David's writing and he says this. When you said, seek my face, my heart said back to you, your face, O Lord, will I seek. In other words, David lived ready to respond to God's invitation. The moment you say to me, seek my face, the moment you draw me close, call me closer, the moment you're saying, come up here, the moment you're saying, lay that down. The moment you're saying, do this. The moment, the moment that your voice comes, I'm going to treat it as sweet as honey. And I'm going to eat it. I'm going to receive it. I'm going to embrace it. And if it's hard and difficult and sacrificial, I still say yes. Because everything in me just wants to hear you, Lord. Everything in me wants to hear you.